kite. I know this is an odd story. I don't understand it myself. And if I set it down in black and white, it's only with a faint hope that when I've written it, I may get a clearer view of it. Or rather with the hope that some reader, better acquainted with the complications of human nature than I am, may offer me an explanation. It was told me one evening by my friend Ned Preston. Ned was a prison visitor. He took his duties very seriously and made the prisoner's troubles his own. Come in. Mr. Preston, sir. Oh, hello, Preston. Hello. Didn't expect you until tomorrow. Sit down. Thanks. Yes, I'm a day early. I've got a conference at the Home Office tomorrow. Anything for me? Well, here are the new arrivals. Oh, and Soames gets out tomorrow. Ah, yes, I'll have a word with him. I'll see these others, too. Anything else? Yes, I'd like you to see number 142, name of Sunbrae. And well, what's he in for? Well, it's a queer case. I'd rather you saw him first, see what you make of it. 142, Sunbrae. 142, Sunbrae. This is him, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And my name is Preston. I'm what they call a prison visitor. Oh, yes. Why don't you sit down? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry I can't offer you a fag or a glass of beer. That's all right. Lovely day it's been. Yes, it's been very nice. Just the right sort of wind. Steady northwest. Gusty enough to make you watch it, but not strong enough to tear things up. Tear what up? Hmm? Oh, nothing. Uh, what, what can I do for you, mister? That's what I can do for you, Sambria. That's what I've come to see you about. As I understand it, you've left your young wife and you refuse to provide for her. That's right. But you can't let her starve. Why not? Why not? Good heavens, man, what's she done to deserve that? She's done something I'll never forgive to my dying day. And what was that? She smashed my kite. She what? She smashed my kite. <laughs> That seemed to be a queer thing for the boy to say. So I said, what's she ever done to harm you? And he said, she smashed my kite. That's right. What, you knew about it? <laughs> yes, he told me the same thing. Said he'd been interested in kites ever since he was a kid of seven or eight. And his parents took him for a walk on the common one Saturday afternoon. There were plenty of kites up that day, more than he'd ever seen at one time before. And they fascinated Herbert. And according to Mr. Sunbury, a new kite flying club had just been started around there and was becoming very popular with the locals. And the more he watched, the more Herbert was certain that nothing would give him greater pleasure in this world than a kite of his own. So he broached his mother on the delicate subject and was told that if he was a good boy and brushed his teeth regularly every morning, he might get a surprise at Christmas. The thrill of that first kite was something Herbert never quite forgot. He couldn't get out to flight fast enough. Well, you know how it is. Some kids collect butterflies or postage stamps. Some are mad about fretwork. Well, Sunbury flew kites. In fact, it became a sort of passion with him and his parents. Herbert, aren't you going to come and have your tea? Okay. Eh? Oh, yes. Sorry, Mum. What are you doing? I'm designing a new kite. Designing one? Show us. Now, I reckon if we could build a kite like this, only about six feet long, we could lick anything else on the common. It's a queer shape, isn't it? Well, that's the idea. So it'll take the wind. Here and here. See? Why don't you make it, Herbert? Eh? Oh, it, it'll cost a bit. How much? Oh, about five pounds, even if we built it ourselves. Well, I don't mind springing hull. Getting extravagant, aren't you? Not at all. If Herbert's got a brilliant new design, it's up to us to back him up. I could manage 30 shillings. No, you don't need to find anything. You just do the work and your father and I'll find the cash. You will? Beatrice. It's all right. I've got a little put aside. Now, you get started on it right away. Tea's ready. All right, Mum, just coming. How's it going on? Pretty well. We've just finished the first drawing. We'll be able to start construction next week. Well, you'd better come and have your tea now. Right, Mum. Oh, Mum, I've asked a young lady to tea tomorrow. Is that all right? 
You've done what? I've asked a young lady to tea. Who is she? Her name's Baker. Betty Baker. I met her at the pictures. She was sitting next to me. She dropped her bag and I picked it up and she said thank you, so naturally we got talking. And you fell for an old trick like that? Dropped her bag indeed. Oh, no, you're mistaken, Mum. She's a nice girl, really she is. Well, when did all this happen? Oh, about three months ago. Oh, you met her three months ago and asked her to tea tomorrow? Oh, I've seen her since, of course. See, on that day I asked her if she'd come to the pictures with me on the Tuesday and she said she didn't know. Perhaps she wouldn't, perhaps she wouldn't. But she came all right. Of course she did. I could have told you that. Oh, look, Mum, I don't want to force her on you. If, if you. if you don't want her to come to tea, I can tell her you don't feel very well and take her somewhere else. You do as you please. I've no patience with you. What's the matter with her? She'll be all right when she gets used to the idea. She doesn't like strangers, that's all. My dear, quite a spread. I wasn't going to let her think we was just nobodies. I wonder what she'd be like. Need you ask? Oh, I don't know. Herbert's got his head screwed on the right way. Nonsense, he's just a child. Any designing chit of a girl could twist him round her little finger. Well, we'd better wait and see. We won't have to wait long. Here they are. Well, just a sec. Let's see if I'm all right. How do I look? Fine. This is Betty, Dad. Pleased to meet you, Betty. Come inside. This is Betty, Mum. Miss Baker, I presume. And that's right. But you can call me Betty. I think the acquaintance is a little short for that. Won't you sit down, Miss Baker? Thank you. Samuel, dear, will you ask Miss Baker if she'll have some bread and butter or a piece of cake? And both, Miss Baker. I like to see people eat hearty. Tea, Miss Baker. Thank you. Milk and sugar? Yes, please. Two lumps? Thank you. Thank you, dear. Oh! Oh, I am sorry. No, it doesn't matter at all. I'll give you another piece. Don't bother, please. I'm sure the floor's quite clean. I should hope so. But I wouldn't dream of letting you have some cake that's been on the floor. I don't really want any more. Really, I don't. I'm sorry you don't like my cake. It tastes all right to me. Oh, it isn't that. It's just that I'm not hungry. I never have a big tea. I'm down for a fag, Bert. A cigarette for Miss Baker, Herbert. We prefer to call our son Herbert Miss Baker. I know. When he told me his name was Herbert, I nearly burst out laughing. Fancy calling anybody Herbert. <laughs> Proper scream, I call it. I think it's a very nice name, but of course it all depends on what class of people one is. If you see what I mean. Why don't you sit down and stop worrying? How can I, when I think of Herbert being mixed up with a girl like that? Oh, I don't know. She's a pretty little thing in her way. Pretty my foot, all that powder and paint. She looked very different with her face washed and without a perm. Common, that's what I call her. Common as dirt. There he is now. Don't go upsetting him. I think I know how to treat my own son, thank you. Well, what's the matter with you? What do you think? I'm fed up. Now, Herbert, you didn't ought to talk to your mother like that. Well, she shouldn't treat Betty like that. Like what? You know what I mean. I do not know what you mean, Herbert. And all I have to say is that I'm surprised that a son of mine should insult his mother by bringing a woman like that into the house. Well, what's wrong with Betty? Would you like me to tell you? Yes. She's common and cheap, cheap as dirt. You've no right to say that. I have a right to say what I like in my own house. And let me tell you this, she's never going to set foot in this house again, not if I know it. Oh, well, before you start saying that, you may as well know. I'm engaged to her. You're not. I've been thinking about it for a long time, and she was so upset tonight, I felt sorry for her, so I popped the question. I had a rare job persuading her, I can tell you. <laughs> you fool. You fool. Herbert? Twenty past. Just coming. You'll miss your train. Wish I could get Saturday mornings off. You will, when you're my age. You off, Herbert? Yes, Mum. I'll make dinner half past one, then we can have a nice afternoon's flying. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I shan't be coming this afternoon. Why not, Herbert? I'm going to see the rooms. What rooms? For Betty and me. What do you want rooms for until you're married? Oh, we're getting married the week after next. 
I found a half a house in Dabney Street and I'm furnishing it out of my post office savings money. Oh, no, Herbert, oh, no. Oh, come on, Mum, don't take it so hard. Things will never be the same again. Of course they will. You'll like Betty once you get to know her. She's a nice girl, really, she is. You must just give her a chance. We can still go on flying our kite on Saturday afternoons, just like we always did. Well, Betty can't see anything in kite flying yet, but she'll come round to it. Even if she doesn't, I'll come. If you marry that woman, Herbert, you'll never fly the new kites of there. Why not? It's mine, isn't it? You gave it to no, me. No, no, I never did. I said we'd put up the money if you did the work. I didn't say anything about giving it 